Hello, I'm Pedro Mora with Pacific Media, and now Pauline. We have two speakers for you today. From Chicago, Professor Jerry Harris will speak about the capitalist structures of accumulation. But first, we will hear from Professor William Carroll from the University of Victoria. He explains what the alternative policy groups are and how they might eventually change our social system. Here is Bill. So my focus here is on specifically transnational alternative policy groups. I'm going to call them TAGs because T-A-P-G-S is impossible to pronounce. So I'll just call them TAGs, transnational alternative policy groups. Um, these are groups that pose their politics globally. And the groups are the counter-hegemonic response to such well-known transnational hegemonic initiatives as the Trilateral Commission or the Bilderberg Conferences or the World Business Council for Sustainable Development or indeed the World Economic Forum. Um, so uh, just a few um, very basic theoretical points before I launch into this largely empirical kind of uh, 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 and very preliminary study. Um, a Gramscian take on knowledge and power is really, you know, motivating this project. That is to say that uh, knowledge is produced by, or, by intellectuals of various kinds, and organic intellectuals of the capitalist class are especially important in organizing and legitimating an advanced capitalist way of life. The, the history of conventional think tanks, which is going to be the starting point here, forms part of a story of class formation from above beginning with the initially marginal efforts of Hayek through the uh, Mont Pelerin Society to rebuild anti-socialist science. Um, think tanks of the right have become important sites of knowledge production and mobilization in the construction of a neoliberal discursive field. These collective intellectuals continue to proliferate. A good example is the hard right Atlas network that you may or may not have heard of which uh, fosters and supports more than 400 market-oriented think tanks around the world, most of them nationally focused. Um, this is a map of uh, the 400 or so uh, think tanks. And it's, it's on the Atlas website. You can go move e effortlessly on this map to uh, find out about any of those 400 uh, neoliberal think tanks. Um, of course, Vancouver's uh, Fraser Institute is a key member. But so is the Shanghai Institute of Finance and Law. Um, now, set against the high-profile purveyors of hegemonic policy, such as the Atlas Network and so on and so forth, sites of cognitive praxis from below have been slower to form, much more modestly resourced, and until recently have tended to focus on national theaters of political contention. All this reflects the difficulties of moving from some alternative to counter hegemony. Despite some formal resemblances, conventional and alternative think tanks differ substantively procedurally and in their orientations to the future. These differences raise daunting challenges for tags. Substantively, the call for global justice and ecological salvation challenges well-entrenched hegemonies of state sovereignty and possessive individualism, which, as neoliberalism has penetrated everyday life, have taken on a veneer of common sense. It's not surprising to find that these cycles are to some extent in phase. On the one hand, capitalism's crises and contradictions have provided impetus for radical cognitive praxis. On the other hand, the establishment of vibrant movement communities in the late 60s and 70s and in the 1990s created a need among activists for alternative political knowledge and a supply of movement intellectuals who could produce and mobilize such knowledge. But I think a challenge for these groups is to move beyond a Polanian defense, uh, defensive critique of neoliberal globalization into a prefigurative mode. Now, I want to talk a bit about what I mentioned before, moving beyond the Polanian uh, defensive critique of uh, uh, neoliberal globalization. Because there are six tags in particular that devote considerable attention to 
prefigurative knowledge production and mobilization, advocating clearly articulated alternatives to neoliberal globalization. So I've tried to just put them into a, a little table here for the sake of brevity. It could, you know, this could be a paper in itself, just sort of sorting out the, the richness of these visions. But this schematic summary of their counter-hegemonic projects suggests that as the production and mobilization of knowledge becomes attuned to the possibilities for a transformed future, the gap between cognition and action closes. And in each case, the point is not simply to critique mainstream policy, nor to offer policy alternatives within the existing institutional arrangements. Rather, prefigurative knowledge production and mobilization consciously cultivates and promulgates radical alternatives designed to set in motion processes of transformation. To accomplish this, alternative policy groups need to be in close dialogue with the social movements whose collective agency can drive transformative change. To what extent do they really uh, push prefiguration as a form of knowledge production and mobilization? That is envisaging and building post-capitalist alternatives versus a concentration on critique and um, resistance to current hegemonies. And uh, what we're looking at here is the uh, network of pro-business policy boards connected into the largest um, corporate boards uh, of the world, the 500 largest corporations of the world. I don't have time to really explain this, but you, the actual policy groups are, are the labeled ones there, like the World Economic Forum or the Trilateral Commission TC there. And you can see they're very much at the center, this highly networked uh, elite uh, of uh, corporate directors and organic intellectuals. Um, by pulling top corporate directors together onto their boards, the Trilater Trilateral Commission, the World Economic Forum, and so on, play especially integrative roles in shrinking the social space of the global elite, linking business leaders to intellectuals and leaders from other fields and creating a unified voice. Now, of course, networks have also been shown to be both prerequisites for and emergent from social movements. This directs our attention to the activist networks that TAGS help sustain and enrich, and to the following research question. Do these groups play roles that are analogous to hegemonic policy groups? Do they help carry a networked configuration of transnational counterpublics and movements? Do they integrate a historical block around democratic globalization? So that's sort of the research question. Um, these preliminary findings point toward a nascent historical block, a transnational network of counterpublics organized um, um, are, and articulated to a range of movements opposing neoliberal globalization, if not capitalism. But this nascent formation from below is, of course, overshadowed, as I've noted, by the far more extensive and established block that sustains capitalist hegemony. The findings raise as many questions as they answer and beg for clarification through more in-depth inquiry. So one set of questions is what do these networks actually do? What do they enable? Um, how do they contribute to counter-hegemonic politics? Uh, another set of questions interrogates the roles that uh, TAGs actually play in practice and the challenges they face in counter-hegemonic knowledge production and mobilization. How do they actually function as think tanks of a different sort, combining research and analysis with dialogical democratizing practice? How do they support protest politics, criticizing neoliberal -global, neo globalization, helping to mobilize resistance while fostering what Michelle Williams has termed generative politics, developing and advancing alternatives to neoliberal capitalism, what I earlier called prefigurative knowledge production and mobilization. Alternatively, what are the inertial challenges in practicing counter-hegemonic knowledge production and mobilization? Might established approaches predicated upon professional expertise, bureaucratic organization, monological communication, might these get replicated as the groups strive to have tangible impact with modest resources? Um, a few more points uh, coming out of our uh, discussion of discourse and social space 
The questions really bring us to matters of discourse uh, through which tags produce distinct political projects. Um, we find that tags are positioned politically, culturally, and geographically in a complex social space. Differential positioning poses different opportunities and risks for tags as sites of counter-hegemonic agency. Groups that are strongly grounded within nation states face the risk of capture within the perimeters of those states. Yet they are positioned to help inform nationally, national level processes of socio-political socio transformation, which are often quite crucial. On the other hand, groups that operate in transnational spaces face the challenge of establishing the relevancies of their analyses and initiatives to local on the ground movement actors through tangible dialogical co uh, collaborations. Theory, including critical discourses tags produce and circulate, becomes a material force, as Marx put it, as soon as it has gripped the masses. But the co corollary is that ideas that remain disembedded as abstract formulations are little more than what Gramsci called castles in the air. Our tentative exploration of tag social space suggests other opportunities and risks. Related to the point just made, northern-based groups need to avoid tendencies toward abstract universalism, as in uh, much, uh, univer uh, much uh, human rights discourse, while southern-based groups need to bring the energy of anti-imperialist and indigenous perspectives, often exemplary of militant particularism, into global vision. Open spaces and more formal organizations must develop their projects in ways that avert their be becoming respectively talking shops and instruments of rail politique. For all groups, regardless of how they are positioned and organized, what uh, de Souza uh, Santos calls the work of translation of bridging across languages, identities, visions, that work of translation looms very large. Within the World Social Forum discussions, it's become clear that the global left is intercultural, as de Sosa uh, Santos puts it. Um, transnational alternative policy groups, most of them active participants at the World Social Forum, need to elaborate practices of intercultural translation that preserve autonomy while creating common ground. Now, it would be a mistake to suppose that the various sites of counter-hegemonic knowledge production and mobilization that have grown out of global capitalism's ca crises and contestations are decisive or primal forces in ultra-globalization <laughs> politics. Um, still, the intellectual leadership that they provide does matter, and in this sense, the future of the global left and the prospects for meaningful responses to global economic and ecological crises depend in part on the effectiveness of transnational alternative policy groups in learning from, working with, informing, and inspiring critical movements and publics in a great variety of locations, in global civil society, and across a wide range of issues, in a multi-form politics of resistance and reconstruction. Thank you. <laughs>